How we doing? Okay, not great. That's fine. Okay, good to see you. Well, my name is Timothy Atik, and I'm the director of Breakaway Ministries in College Station. Uh, and I'm so glad to be back at Harris Creek. This is a place that I love. Uh, my wife and I and our kids, we called Harris Creek our church home for four years when I lived in Waco leading uh, vertical ministries. I served as an elder here, and I love the opportunity to come back. And uh, since the last time I was here, a lot has changed. And uh, God, in his kindness, has called JP to come and be your pastor. And so I just want to celebrate what God has done here at Harris Creek. JP is one of the greatest communicators I know. He's one of the greatest leaders that I know. Uh, probably more than anything, though, he's one of the greatest examples that I know of someone who passionately follows Jesus Christ. So I'm so glad to get to fill in for him this morning. Let me pray for us. And then we'll jump in. Well, Lord Jesus, thanks so much for the opportunity to gather and to open up your word. God, thank you that you are a God who wants to be heard. And you have, in your kindness, spoken to us. And so I just pray that as we open your word, it would be like opening your mouth. And would you open up our ears to hear from you this morning? We need you. We love you. I just want to invite you guys to take a second and in the quietness of your own heart, just pray and say, God, would you speak to me now? through your word. And then take a second, and I just ask that you pray for me. Just say, God, would it be your words through TA to me this morning? God, thanks for this time. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, several years ago, uh, my family and I, we were living in Austin, Texas, and the church that I was working at decided to do a joint Good Friday service with several other churches in the Austin area. This was several years ago when we lived in Austin. And so my family and I, we made our way down to this convention center in downtown Austin for this Good Friday service. And my son Noah was about two years old at the time, and we went into the service, and he was being vocal at times when it probably wasn't best to be vocal. And so my wife and I, we just made the decision that it would probably be best for us and everyone else around us if we went and we watched the service from the TV screens in the lobby. So we went out there and we handed Noah just a ball and we said, go somewhere. And he just began to play catch with himself and that bought us about 30 minutes, which was amazing, because we were the only people out in this lobby. There was like one guy way down here, but it was really just us watching this service. And I will never forget, as we're sitting there watching uh, this Good Friday service go on, this guy walked in, and he was wearing a hat that said, I heart Jesus. Now, if you're ever wondering if someone loves Jesus, and they're wearing a hat that says they do. It's really helpful. It's like, I wonder if that guy, no, he does love Jesus. He's wearing a hat. I know exactly how he feels about Jesus. But I'll never forget this guy was walking. He was about to walk past me. And right as he got even with me, he stopped. He turned. He looked at me and goes, hey, do you love Jesus? I was like, man, if only I had worn my hat, he, would have, he wouldn't have even had to ask. But I forgot it at home. Fortunately, I'd been to seminary, so I knew my answer to this question. I said, yeah, I do, in fact, love Jesus. Unfortunately, that was like the climax of our conversation, and it was all downhill from there because he proceeded to tell me. Uh, he said, you know what? I wish that they would let me lead this Good Friday service because all those guys in there, they're just false prophets, false teachers. And I was like, that's interesting because my senior pastor is helping lead the service. I should probably ask him if he's a false prophet prophet because if he is I might need to go work somewhere else <laughs> and then he said this he said um, the reason that Jesus came to earth was to live a perfect life and to show us how we can live perfect lives so that we can go to heaven and I didn't agree with that because I know myself and I know that I'm very imperfect but I believe that I will spend eternity with God because I know the only one who's ever been perfect and that's Jesus Christ. Uh, I made the unfortunate decision of letting him know that I did not agree with him and it started this back and forth of him being like, what do you think about this? And I'd be like, well, what do you think about this? And my wife was like, what are you doing? And I was like, he's wrong. And so we're just going 
back and forth, and I, I can tell that with each answer I give, this guy is getting more and more amped up. Like everything that I'm saying is just hitting him in the worst of ways. And I can, you can just see his, his tolerance level decreasing and his passion level increasing. And I guess it just reaches this boiling point where he looks me in the eye, he points his finger at me and he says, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. I mean, what do you do with that? I'm a pastor, that's supposed to be my line. What am I gonna say? No, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Like who wins the rebuking in the name of Jesus Christ? And then it got more weird because he was like, are you prepared to say the seven words? No. He's like, because if you're not prepared to say the seven words, then you're not a child of God. And I was like, I am not prepared to say the seven words, but I believe that I am a child of God. And then he went into the service and um, I was so rattled because it was my first time to be rebuked in the name of Jesus Christ that I couldn't (laughs) just bring it back together. And so I told my wife, I said, hey, let's just get out of here. The evening ended with my wife son and I sprinting through the parking garage to speed away in our sweet white Buick minivan because we saw this guy walking. We thought he was coming to kill us. Anyway, (laughs) it was a pretty good Friday, but that (laughs) was weird. Now, why do I tell you that? The reason I tell you that is because as I stop and I think back about that story, here's the reality. That guy believed that he was following Jesus Christ, but I believe that I'm following Jesus Christ. But if you look at what that guy says it looks like to follow Jesus Christ, and you were to look at what I say it looks like to follow Jesus Christ, it would appear as if we are following two totally different Jesuses. One way says be perfect to be loved. Mine says we experience love because we know the only one who's ever been perfect. Those are two totally different Jesuses to follow. And as I think about that story and I think about this room, I I think about the fact that there are hundreds of people in this room who would classify themselves as followers of Jesus Christ. But here's the reality. If there was a way for us to kind of line up our lives side by side by side by side, and we were to evaluate what does everyone say it looks like to follow Jesus Christ, I wonder if as we look at our lives side by side by side, I wonder if someone from the outside might look in and be like, it looks like there are hundreds of different Jesuses to follow in this world. Like I think a good question that any follower of Jesus Christ should ask is you open up this word and if you were to lay your life on this word, would there be a stark contrast between what Jesus says it looks like to follow him in how you're actually following him? Would there be massive discrepancies between this book and your um, living out what it looks like to follow Jesus? Here's what we're gonna do. I know that you guys have been in a series just simply called Lent. Today I wanna look at really the enemy of Lent. I wanna look at the life of, of Judas Iscariot. Now who does that, right? Like when's the last time you heard a talk just about Ju- Judas? When was the last, is that, you're, you're like, yeah, there's people out there that are like, you know what, just been meditating on the life of Judas. It's been a breath of fresh air to my soul. Like he gets me, all right? He's kind of my boy, Ju- like no, we don't, we don't give entire messages to the life of Judas, but I wanna talk about Judas this morning and here's why. What if, if you're following anyone, what if you're following Judas more than you're actually following Jesus? Like if your life looks like anyone's life, what if your life looks more like Judas's life than Jesus's life? And so really the point of this message is follow Jesus. So if you have a Bible, turn with me this morning to Matthew 26. Matthew 26 is where we're going to be. And I'll just warn you, the names Judas and Jesus sound very similar. So if any point in the morning I give you an opportunity to invite Judas into your heart, don't do it. Like, I don't know what would happen, but let's just not take the chance, all right? 
And here's how I'm going to encourage you to evaluate whether you're following Judas or Jesus. I'm going to help you evaluate that by simply giving you three clarifying questions that you need to ask and answer in the quietness of your own heart. Here we go, Matthew 26, verse 14. It says this, Then one of the twelve whose name was Judas Iscariot. Now I need to just go ahead and stop right there because those few words are really pregnant with meaning. It says, then one of the 12 whose name was Judas Iscariot. That reality that Judas was one of the 12 12 tells us so much. It tells us that Judas was actually handpicked by Jesus to spend every moment of every day for three years beholding all of Jesus' messages and all of Jesus' miracles. So just think, when Jesus turned water to wine, Judas was there. When Jesus fed the 5,000, Judas was there. When Jesus cast out a legion of demons and sent them into a herd of pigs that ran down a mountain and off a cliff and drowned themselves, Judas was there. When Jesus made the blind see, Judas was there. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Judas was there. He had front row seats to all of Jesus' messages and all of Jesus' miracles as one of the 12. But now watch how Matthew 26 proceeds. It says this, Then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Let me just say, what's up with that? Like, how does that even happen? How do you go from being one of the 12 to actually betraying Jesus Christ? Well, let me just give you my theory. I think it was possible for this to happen because Judas had been around Jesus without actually grasping who Jesus truly was. And my fear for many people in this room is that that story might be your story. Is it possible that you have been around Jesus in the things of Jesus without actually grasping who Jesus is? Because here's what you need to know. Being around Jesus does not mean that you're following Jesus. Like being around the things of Jesus does not mean that you are following Jesus. Let me position it a different way. Uh, Judas, I believe, had intellectual knowledge of who Jesus was and what he could do, but he had no experiential knowledge in his own life of who Jesus was and what he could do. So the first question that you need to ask yourself is this. Does your intellectual knowledge have any experiential knowledge? Does your intellectual knowledge have any experiential knowledge? Just think, Judas had the intellectual knowledge that Jesus was in the business of satisfying hunger. Judas was there. He was one of the guys carrying baskets when Jesus multiplied the loaves and fed over 5,000 people. Judas would have been present when Jesus stood up and declared, I'm the bread of life. What was Jesus saying? He's saying, I am the one and only one who can satisfy the deepest longings of your soul. Judas had the intellectual knowledge that Jesus was the great physician. He saw the the dead raised and the lame walk. Judas had intellectual knowledge that Jesus was in the business of healing that which was broken, but Judas never allowed Jesus to step into his own life and heal the brokenness in his own soul. And so how did Judas's life end? Well, his brokenness compounded to the point where he betrayed the Son of God and went and committed suicide. See, Judas had intellectual knowledge of who Jesus was and what he could do, but he had no experiential knowledge of who Jesus was and what he can do. And the reason I even bring that up is what you need to realize is if you have, experiential, if you have intellectual knowledge but no experiential knowledge, <coughs> of who Jesus is and what he can do, then it's possible that you are fooling yourself if you tell yourself that you are actually following Jesus. Because if all there is is information with no application that leads to transformation, we might be fooling ourselves. Let me just position it this way. Your new pastor, JP, great friend, you, you can... 
um, go online. You can listen to every message that he's ever given. You can sit here every Sunday morning and listen to him. You can go and read his book, Welcome to Adulting. You can follow him on social media. You can know every person's name in his family. You can know all of his likes and dislikes. And you might find yourself sitting in one of Waco's latest coffee shops and JP is gonna walk in. And in that moment, because you have been around JP so much without even realizing it, you're gonna be that creepy person who's smiling at JP and waving at him. And when he looks at you and gives you this look of, are you waving at me or someone else? You're gonna snap back to reality and and you're gonna walk up to JP and be like, "Uh, you don't know me, but I know you. And in that moment, you're actually lying because you don't know JP, you just know a lot about JP. And so I just wanna make sure that we're not lying to ourselves. See, the reality is we can spend time reading this book and we can come in here and we can sit through sermons and we can step into small groups and we can attend a lot of religious, Christian, Jesus-centered events. But if all there is is information with no application, let's just, let's just clarify in our own hearts what is really true. Now, let me just be clear. What I'm not trying to do is make you uh, question whether you're, you're genuinely saved or not. What I am trying to do, though, is have a clarifying conversation with a few people in this room. So I just want to ask you, is there any experiential knowledge with your intellectual knowledge? Let me position it in a different way. When it comes to Jesus, which word best correlates with the name Jesus in your life, religion or relationship. Let me position it one more way. Do you know the Jesus who lived or do you know the Jesus who lives? To know the Jesus who lived is to know the Jesus that lived about 2,000 years ago, and yeah, he um, lived on this earth, and then he died on a cross for the sins of the world, and now he's a poster child of a worldwide religion. That's knowing the Jesus who lived He really has little to do with your life today. He's more just the figurehead of a religion that you in some way subscribe to, but there is little to no desire to actually engage with the person of Jesus Christ. Do you know the Jesus who lived or do you know the Jesus who lives? Yeah, he lived 2,000 years ago. Yeah, he died on a cross, but when he died on that cross, he was dying for you. He was dying for your sins. He was put in a tomb for you. He rose from the dead victoriously so that you too could be raised to a new life with God for all of eternity. Jesus Christ, on the, he uh, died, he was buried, and on the third day he rose again. He spent about 40 days on earth, and then he ascended into heaven where he is now seated at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning, wanting to have everything to do with your life. Is that the Jesus that you know? If not, the invitation is come. Come and know him. Now, many in this room are probably sitting there saying, I know him. Yeah, like I I believe in the Jesus who lives. Yeah, there there isn't just intellectual knowledge. That intellectual knowledge has been partnered with experiential knowledge. So TA, move on. You're not speaking to me. Well, let's let's just be honest. At least for me, I can identify with Judas a lot more than I'd ever like to admit. And I wonder if that's true for you too. Are there areas of your life where there's intellectual knowledge without the experiential knowledge? Like there, I I have the intellectual knowledge that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and yet I still allow worry and anxiety to flood my life on a regular basis. I have the intellectual knowledge that Jesus is sovereign over all things, yet there are times where I parent my kids with an excess of caution just because I feel like I can control what will or won't happen to them. I know that Jesus has the intellect, no, I have the intellectual knowledge that Jesus Christ has written all the days of my life into his story. Yet I still need to figure out all aspects of my life, including my future. Can you identify with that at all? Maybe you have the intellectual knowledge that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, yet worry and anxiety is your anthem. 
Maybe you have the intellectual knowledge that Jesus Christ is before all things and in him all things hold together, yet you are um, blossoming as a control freak. Maybe you have the intellectual knowledge that Jesus is the great physician. He's in the business of healing that which is broken, yet you still let pornography rage in your life. And you know what you tell yourself? You say it's not that big of a deal. No, it is a huge deal. Because Jesus Christ, who is the great physician, is saying, I want to step in and heal that which is broken. Let me just be clear. Here is what we are like when we have intellectual knowledge of who Jesus is and what he can do, but we are lacking the experiential knowledge. We are like someone walking around with a dead cell phone holding a charger. How idiotic would this be if I was walking around like, phone's dead. (laughs) Hey, dude, you tried to call me? Hey, phone's dead. Wouldn't you be like, well, find an outlet. <laughs> like, it, there, there's one right there. Hey, dude, phone's dead. How weird would that be? It's like, yeah, porn's not a big deal. It's like, no, plug into the great physician. Like, you know Jesus Christ. The same power that raised him from the dead actually lives inside of you. Plug into the power of the Holy Spirit, which can allow self-control to be exhibited in your life. Man, I'm just so stressed out. They say I need to get seven to nine hours of sleep. I think it's per week. No, it's per night. I'm just so stressed out, man. Plug into the Prince of Peace. He's committed to being present in your life every moment of every day. Man, I need to be in control of every aspect of my kids' lives. Let me just tell you, you can't be. Like God has rigged life to where you're gonna want control but won't be able to have it. So you might as well just plug in to the one who is before all things and in him all things hold together. So answer that question. Does your intellectual knowledge have any experiential knowledge? The second question that I want to encourage you to ask is this, who or what do you need more than Jesus? Who or what do you need more than Jesus? Let me just read you what I read earlier. Matthew 26, verse 14. I just want to point out something a little different. It says, then one of the 12, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. All eyes on me, don't miss this. Here's what I want you to see. Like the chief priest didn't come to Judas. Judas came to them. Do you see that? Judas was the one who initiated with them. They didn't come to Judas and be like, hey, Judas, uh, we know you've been hanging out with Jesus. Totally hypothetical scenario. How do you feel about betrayal? Hypothetically speaking, like that wasn't the conversation. What does it say? Judas comes to them and asks a question. What's the question? What will you give me? It's a question about money, right? How much, what's the price tag for Jesus Christ? Keep that in mind. And if you have a Bible, turn over to John chapter 12. This happens within a week, few days of Judas going to the chief priest and having the conversation we just talked about. Judas finds himself in a home with Jesus and his friends, and this woman comes and breaks open a very expensive bottle of ointment and anoints Jesus with it. And here's the the author zooms in on Judas Iscariot, and here's his response. Verse 4, it says this, But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, the author tells us why Judas said this. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money back, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So just merge the two stories together. Here's one um, uh, instance with chief priests. 
what will you give me? How much money can I get for Jesus? John chapter 12, why wasn't this ointment sold for 300 denarii? And then the author tells us he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He used to pilfer from Jesus' bank account. So when you put those two stories together, what do you see about Judas? He was obsessed with money. Judas was obsessed with money. Money was, in a sense, the rudder of his ship. It's what directed the course of his life. And we can, we can look at this story and we can, we can just basically conclude that when J Judas went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me? All he's declaring in that moment is I need the God of money more than I need the God of the universe. Judas was simply declaring what he needed more than Jesus Christ. Now, we can look at this story about Judas and be like, dude, you're such a moron. Like, clearly, he's the antagonist. Jesus is the protagonist. But let's just be honest with ourselves. Often throughout the week and even on a daily basis, there are times where we are declaring that we need someone or something more than we need Jesus. And if you wanna kinda dial into what it is for you, just pay attention to what you think about all the time. Like what do you get lost in thought about? What keeps you awake at night? What stresses you out? What do you find yourself talking about consistently with your family or friends? It's possible, I'm not saying for sure, but it is possible that that person or that thing just might be your God. And whether you realize it or not, you are declaring that I need that person or that thing more than I need Jesus Christ. Let me give you an example for, from my own life. For the downtown campus, I probably just disappeared. So my apologies. And here I am again, downtown campus, good to see ya. Um, I, um, I have this bag of mementos from this dating relationship I was in during my freshman year at Texas A&M University. And I'm most assuredly going to regret doing this. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say that, but y'all might never see me again, so. Why not? So, um, let's see, what do I wanna show you first? Um, yeah, we'll go with this. This is, uh, we'll just ease into things. This is a mouse pad that she gave me. Okay, for the next like Generation Z people, this is called a mouse pad. We used to need these things for our mice. But uh, anyway, <laughs> it's a baseball glove. I didn't play baseball. I lost hand, all hand-eye coordination in fifth grade, so I just ran. But um, she gave it to me anyway, and it, there's a collage of her pictures so that I could always see her. This, this is a, a beanie baby that she gave me, and uh, she sprayed it with her perfume so I could, you know, <laughs> she'd always be with me. Uh, Generation Z, this is called a CD. <laughs> we used to need these to listen to anything. Some of you are like, I couldn't play that right now if I wanted to. Like, I don't even have the ability to put this in something. But this is called a CD that she made for me. It's titled, For My Perfect Boyfriend. <laughs> That's this guy. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, this is pretty awesome. <laughs> this, is, this is a pillow that has our picture ironed onto it. Now, okay. I need you to know that my wife knows I have these things, all right? <laughs> like, she knows. I'm not at home in the corner like, my precious. It's not like that. <laughs> I promise. And uh, last, uh, this will make you throw up in your mouth, but... Um, <laughs> this is so dumb. This is... <laughs> This is a binder with a printout of every email and every message conversation. Don't you judge me, I heard that. <laughs> you don't know me. Anyway, um, it's a printout of every message and 
every email that transpired throughout our relationship. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, how long do you think we dated? Two months. <laughs> Stop judging me. Therapy really helps with situations like this, I promise. No. Just follow me on this, <laughs> if you can. Uh, during those two months, without a doubt, that girl was absolutely my God. She was. I know that looking back. And I know that because she got all of my time, all of my attention, and all of my affection. I needed her more than I needed anyone else, including Jesus. Now, I've shown you this stuff, and we can laugh about it, but I just wanna ask you a really honest question. What's in your bag? Like, you might not have all of this junk to show for it, and your, might, your bag might look a lot more sophisticated, and it might be a lot more socially acceptable, but what is in your bag? Who or what are you declaring with your life that you need more than you need Jesus? For you students, it might be a boyfriend or girlfriend. Your boyfriend or girlfriend might be your lifeline. I was talking with a college student just last week, and his life is centered on the fact that he wants a girlfriend more than anything. It's the deepest longing of his soul. For some of you, it might be a GPA that you don't know who you would be. Your self-worth would tank if your GP wasn't a, GPA wasn't a certain number. Who or what do you need more than Jesus? Maybe you feel like you need a, a bigger house or a better spouse. Maybe you need just to make a little bit more money, just a little bit more money. Well, how much money? I don't know, just a little bit more money than I'm making right now. Maybe you need a nicer car. Maybe you need more friends. I don't know what it is for you. More well-behaved kids, just a, a, a better love life. I don't know what it is for you. But you need to identify who or what are you saying with your life you need more than you need Jesus. You know what the interesting thing is? is during those two months, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. But my roommate had to look at the stuff every day for two months. And after I got out of the relationship, it was just so clear to him. It was like, dude, why didn't you just pull me aside lovingly, slap me in the face and be like, snap out of it. But he could see what I couldn't. So I tell you that just to say, you know what? You might not be able to identify the God in your life. And so that's why community is so important. That's why I encourage you to belong to a smaller group of people here at Harris Creek within the context or in that context is a place where you need to be fully known and fully loved. And so I just want to encourage you even today to call some of your closest friends or to make yourself vulnerable enough with your spouse or your kids to just say, hey, look, what am I declaring with my words, with my time, and with my actions? What am I saying I need more of than Jesus Christ? I mean, can we just learn from Judas? How did Judas's life end? It ended with him taking that money, purchasing a field and committing suicide. Part of me wonders, and I don't know because this isn't written in the Bible, so this is just the way things play out in my mind. But I wonder if he got those 30 pieces of silver. And I, I, I just picture Judas running them through his hands, expecting to feel full, and in that moment he felt empty because the thing that he felt he needed most still wasn't enough. Here's what you need to know. Anytime you expect someone or something to be God when they are not in fact God, it will always result in frustration, disappointment, and emptiness. Just wait. The last question that I wanna encourage you to ask yourself is this. Is Jesus your rabbi? or is he your Lord? That's it, is Jesus your rabbi or your Lord? Here's why I 
ask that question. Look back at Matthew 26. Just look at verses 20 through 25. I just want to show you something. I still remember when a pastor pointed this out, and it's stuck with me for well over 10 years now. When it was evening... He, this is Jesus, he reclined at table with the 12, and as they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, you have said so. So all eyes on me, don't miss what is happening here. Jesus is having his last meal with his friends. And he says, guys, I just need to tell you that one of you guys is going to betray me. And it sets off this reaction around the table where the disciples begin to go around and they begin to say, is it I, Lord? And in the Greek, that statement implies a negative response. It's the equivalent of saying, it's not I, Lord. So they begin to go around, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? And then it gets around to Judas, and what does Judas say? Is it I, Rabbi? See, 11 of the disciples were responding to Jesus in this moment as Lord. Judas was responding to Jesus as Rabbi. Both were very significant titles, titles of honor, but one was far more significant than the other. See, Rabbi means teacher, Lord means master. The disciples were all in the same room physically, but they were on different planets spiritually. See, to to respond to Jesus as rabbi or teacher is to look at him as a good source of wisdom. But betrayal is always a possibility because if you don't like the wisdom, if you don't like something of the teaching, then you can just... Uh, relocate and find someone's teaching that you like better. But to respond to Jesus as Lord is to say, Jesus Christ, you're my master, so my posture before you is one of submission. I'm saying your way is right, my way is wrong. Wherever you're going, I'm gonna follow because I trust that you are a good master, you're a great Lord, and you're a wonderful king. So where you're going, I'm following, and I trust you. That is what it looks like to respond to Jesus Jesus on a daily basis as Lord. The question that you need to ask is, how are you responding to Jesus? Are you viewing him as rabbi or Lord? And let's just dial in to specific areas of your life. When it comes to what you do on the weekend, is Jesus your rabbi or your Lord? When it comes to what you'll do at Dia in just a couple of days, will Jesus be your rabbi or is he going to be your Lord? When it comes to what you do in a dating relationship, will Jesus be your rabbi or your Lord? When it comes to how you talk to your spouse when you're frustrated with them, will Jesus be your rabbi or will he be your Lord? When it comes to you spending money that you don't actually have, will Jesus be your rabbi or will he be your Lord? When it comes to what matters most with your kids, Will Jesus be your rabbi or will he be your Lord? When it comes to whether or not you will cut corners to elevate yourself at work, will Jesus be your rabbi or Lord? When it comes to whether you will tell lies, half-truths, or exaggerations in order to be more well-liked by others, will Jesus be your rabbi or will he be your Lord? I remember sitting on an airplane And I looked to my right and I saw this guy, he was reading his Bible, and I don't know what he's doing. Let me just preface, I don't know what he was doing, but I saw in his hand that he was holding a highlighter and a whiteout pen. I'm like, that's interesting. Now I didn't sit there and stare like, like a creeper, and so I let him do his thing. But I just thought about that and I was like, I don't know what he was doing with his highlighter and whiteout pen, but I know that for us, a lot of times we walk out into life with the word of God and a highlighter and a whiteout pen. So there's certain areas of life where we absolutely are great with Jesus being Lord, and we highlight those areas. Oh, God, you want me to love people no matter what? Yeah, I want to highlight that. Okay, God, you want me to do that? Yeah, I will highlight that. Absolutely, I am all on board. But then there's other areas where it's like, God, I don't want you to touch 
this. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Yeah, well, sometimes that's just not reality. Jesus. Paul, Ephesians 5, 3, there shouldn't even be a hint of any type of impurity or immorality. Yeah, okay, that's a little extreme. Let me just wipe that out. Here's what you need to realize. It is not your responsibility to decide what the Christian life should look like. Jesus has already spelled it out. But what we often want is a, um, is a customized, comfortable Christianity. But if Jesus has called you to do it, that's not radical, that's just normal. That's just the normal Christian life. And so there are certain areas of life that we don't want to give to Jesus because we think we are better off being in control ourselves. But let me just wake you up to reality. Either Jesus will be your king or sin will be your king, but you being king isn't even an option. Any scenario where you're king is a mirage of life. It doesn't even exist. And so I just want to lovingly tell you that submitting every area of your life to the lordship of Jesus is actually a step towards freedom. That's what that is. It's a step towards freedom. A posture of submission is actually a step towards freedom. Will you take it? I just want to end by saying this. You know what? I didn't come here this morning to beat you over the head and be like, you're a Judas. You're a Judas. Jesus loves you. Glad you came to Harris Creek this morning. No, my goal in coming this morning was to in some way be Google Maps for you. To just say, you know what? You've, you've gotten off course. That's okay, but let's redirect because you have a good king who loves you. His grace is sufficient for all of our failures. But if you're going to follow anyone, follow Jesus, not Judas. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you that your grace is sufficient to cover over all of our failures. And there are times when we miss the mark. And there are times often in my life, where my life looks more like Judas's life than your life, Jesus. And I thank you that your payment on the cross was sufficient to cover over all of my failures. But Lord, you're calling us to something more. The same words that you gave the disciples are your words to us, come follow me. And so I pray, God, that we would be people who fix our eyes on you, Lord Jesus. May we run hard after you, God, I pray that we wouldn't just have intellectual knowledge, that we wouldn't just know about you, but that we would truly know you, Lord God. Would you reveal the people or the things in our life that we feel we need more than you? Jesus, the best thing you could give us today is more of yourself. And God, there's areas of our lives that just need to be identified. Would you just gently press in on us and just pinpoint the areas of life that still don't belong completely to you. We know, Lord Jesus, that you will never settle for being rabbi because you are the Lord of lords and King of kings over all creation. We need you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.